I have a fantastic memory, guys, because last week's episode seems like I just shot the end of it two minutes ago because I did, because the episode was really long. And for those of you that hung out till the end of that episode where we opened up the Galliano junk pile because the arch top collapsed, the top of it collapsed, and we need to reinforce it, learned that I was an hour and some into the episode, and we ended with some news about this guitar that you'll definitely covet if and only if you watch the story. And if you didn't, then you can go back up and click the episode link up there, showing up right up there, right about now, and you will learn the story behind this and this. Without that, you will live on in ignorance, my friend, which makes me the smartest one in the room, which I really don't mind. Anyway, where were we? We're on the umpteenth episode of the Galliano Junk Pile playlist up there. Literally, there's anything you could do to fix a cheap arch top in this playlist. Click it, store it. But let's pick back up where we were. We had just removed the back of this for the second time in its life. Well, the first, when I first got it, half the back was off, and we went through and put everything together. Subsequently, after we had one person play it, we strung it up for the next person, and these telltale cracks... And the problem that we had with the tone bars led to the top collapsing. And now, with the back off, I'm going to show you how to build a scrap apparatus contra contraption, not a contraction. It's probably why this thing failed in the first place. But we're going to show you how to build the bridge area on an arch top back up using common... Uh, scrap materials and tools you may have in your shed. So without further ado, let's get to the bench and finish this job up. As we further went into the autopsy with the autopsy camera setup, this is just too cool. Remember, it failed on the base side of the guitar. Okay. So things started creeping down, F-holes started settling, and so this is sunken right here. Now, this brace right here popped halfway down its length. So you're going to see something that's going to freak you out. Yeah, you saw some tight bond. Now, you're thinking, oh, he's never used his tight bond. That is a lie. I always use tight bond when I'm doing necks and scarf joints. Yeah, this is one of mine. Anything that I don't have to take apart or want to come apart or have the possibility to come apart. Building necks is not your marriage. It's not supposed to come apart. So we are going to use tight bond to fix this split right here. So, to use that, first thing we, we need you to know is don't hit the panic button every time that I talk about using tight bond because there is our, okay, English teacher, start your own channel. But anyway, if we had used tight bond on this, we wouldn't be able to fix all this now and have access. So, I've said that a million times. So, Notice that I have a brush right here because I'm going to want to take it and work it in wherever there's a problem with the tight bond. Now, gluing these things up, we saw in the last episode, you have to be very careful with clamping. So, I showed you how to make a couple of what are basically calls C-A-U-L-S, by determining and measuring out the brace width, marking it off, you see those pencil marks, and then cutting that out on a bandsaw. So you're taking this into the bandsaw numerous times to that line and then filing this. So this will drop right down onto there. 
There are also a number of other things you could use. You could use bigger blocks. I've actually been looking for a set of those old blocks that we had in the 60s that said A, B, C, you know, the alphabet that taught you how to read. Yeah, only old men know that. There's a couple of uh, different uh, things you can use, like spools that go back where there's a corner that you have to get into. You can uh, use stuff like this, notch things out, do whatever you want to do. There's a platform on there to stand. You can stack two of these like so and clamp down in the middle. There are no rules except you must keep this coupon, especially if it's chick flick tea. Okay, so here we go. We've got a little bit of a piece of paper here. We're going to put some tight bond on it. We are going to seal up the tight bond right away so we don't have to spend 10 minutes the next time we use it trying to clear it out. But I've pre-moistened this brush here. And we're going to coat it up. You want to remember this wood is thirsty. And so we're going to brush it in where the crack is, where we can see it. In fact, there's a couple of them, so I'm going to need to use quite a bit of this glue here. We're going to make sure that everything is coated here that needs this glue. We're going to pick up doing the structure here later, but I can't have this part being messed up like it is be building that structure and depend on everything to line up until this crack is fixed. All right, there we go. We got plenty. I'm going to use this block that's got the slot cut in it here. Um, it doesn't bottom out. We're going to use this big block here. And then adjust our clamp to be right over things and get the pressure directly down. I have both edges of the clamp padded. All right, there we go. Everything is looking good. Got the bleed off the excess out of the way. That's not going to do much for the acoustic properties. And finally, with that clamp down, we're going to put Grandma's iron right up here and be none too gentle about applying pressure. Now, we wait for glue to dry. I don't want to tell you again. All right, a few hours later, let's take Granny's iron off and get that out of the way. And then... Pull off the clamp. All right, things are going to get a little complicated now. We are going to build spurs, which are kind of like you used to see them on airplane wings that they would cover with cloth. So it's kind of flat on the bottom, and then they have an airfoil shape that curves along the top. So what we're going to do is we're going to want to start off, we've marked off where the bridge sits, supported by these two tone bars. Want to come in about 10 millimeters off of the point of the inside point of sound hole. And we'll make a mark right there. And we'll do the same thing on this side. And I've told you all before, working with millimeters is really easy, especially when you're trying to find half. So we've got 10 millimeters in on both sides. Now we're going to take this and we're going to measure from the edge of that to the edge of this and we are at 146. So half of that is 73. So we're going to mark the center here. Now this may not look like the center between the tone bars. It doesn't matter. Whoever glued these in, they weren't perfect, but we're going to take half of 146 and that is 73, 73, see, very easy. 
So we're going to take a piece of oak hobby stock, okay, not a race car, just stuff that you buy in a craft store, and this is oak, it's strong. So we're going to come down and we're going to measure off 146, you with me, right there, okay. Then we're going to take a square, and we are going to do this. Now, we're going to need two pieces of this because this is what's going to serve as our span, spur, strut, whatever you want to call it, between this. And we're going to need two of them. So I'm going to saw this. Get another one just like it. Okay, there we go. One, two. And if you look, the end of it is right here, lined up with this one, and as is the other end. Now we're going to take a piece of this two-sided tape that we've cut with chick flick teal scissors, of course. And we're going to put one here and one here. We're going to pull off the backing tape, which is sometimes a real pain, and stick these two together. Alrighty then, one and two. And then we just want to put these two together, match up the ends as close as possible, and then pressure down. Now we can go to the belt sander and get these perfectly straight so they match each other identically. Identically. Whatever. Like twins. Two spurs standing up like this together. Alright, we are back from the belt sander. We have a, a piece of work top. That's a piece of an old bottom of the scar box. And we have taken the two pieces glued together and we've rounded the edges off and we know that the distance was 146 between the end points so we would measure 73 in which is half there and somewhere there like so and then we would take our square which I have already done on the other side and found the center now this is going to sit down like this and it's going to have to have a radius in here that's going to push the collapsed arch top back up and we know we can't depend on what that radius is now with it collapsed but what we can depend on is the fact that we were smart and we went in and sanded the floating bridge to the top of the arch top remember really important we had a piece of stick on sandpaper about that wide and what do you know, we can put this up here now, like so, because we know about where the middle is, and we just do this, and what do you know, there's our radius. You see that mark? We just carry it to the end, and to the end, and then we're going to line up where we think the middle is, or the ends of these, that mark there, and that mark here, like so. And we're going to cut from the center point this radius down this way and down Okay, this. check it out. That has a radius into it. Here's the part I cut off, not on the belt sander. That would have taken forever. But the band saw. And then I went out and went over to the belt sander and wound everything off. So, okay. So, we're going to mark... What's well, about the middle now? I'm going to eyeball this. No one is ever going to see this. You're going to see this now. The important part right now is that we are going to mark, understanding that this side is going to go down because it's radiused. We are going to make marks one there, one there, one there, and one there. And those, my friends, is the width of the spur, or the tone bar, excuse me. 
those are going to have to be cut out because these are going to nest over the tone bars now we're going to want to have as much contact as possible so we need to know lining up with here how deep these are we take one of these gadgets right and we just push down on this one it gets to the bottom it's that deep so we know that this is going to be let's call it towards the pots okay and we're going to come down to here like so you see that then when we come over here we're going to go to the same spot it's not quite as deep so we're going to come over to here go to that mark and go to this mark here and this part down to here and here is going to be have to be cut out and we'll do that with a bandsaw by working towards the blade make a series of notches and then take a file and cut these so pays to measure a couple times while you're doing this but this right here knowing that that mark is right there that one's a little bit deeper so yeah right there this is going to be cut out and this is going to be cut out remember these are two pieces one will be on this side of the bridge over in this area one will be here and this is tapered this is at one of the highest points of the radius of the tone bar okay there we go i've done the first couple cuts here i haven't taken them to depth but i am taking this file here and getting again i just cut a bunch of little notches there and then I'm filing these flat. And this side is towards the pots, remember. And everything is going to go right here. So I stand them up here. And what do you know? They stand up. Now, I didn't cut them all the way in. And the reason I didn't do that is because I don't need them to be sloppy. I need them to be just right. So I can measure with this and see how far off the deck I am and what do you know the first marks are right there so we're close I'm going to keep doing this I don't want to get these past here where this thing gets sloppy we want this radius to push down and catch here and here and basically that radius is going to push the top back up so when we attach these and put some weight on them and relieve this of its pressure back here we're going to restore the curve of the arch top so back to doing a little bit more work here okay check this out pots over here we've reached down to the marks and we put this on we want just a little bit of slack up at the top because we don't want to have anything floating here down here we don't want to have anything underneath here so when we pull this up and pressure this down this part pushes down and it restores this so we're going to split these are just a little bit more slack that we need in this pocket right here and i'll do it with this big bastard file yeah i'm talking to you you know how this was named don't blame me but there we go Pots here, flip that upside down there. Yeah, there we go, just like that. We'll split these. Now what I wanna do is I wanna find a way to attach these once they're split so they don't wobble and do all that. And I got a tricky trick to show you there. It's getting messy here, but trust me as I go, Pot side is here, this side is down, 15 millimeters off the edge here and off of the bottom. Give us marks here and here. Remember, you still have two of these 
attached. Now I'm going to drill a hole there and there that matches this dowling. Not Kevin Dowling Fitness Hour, but this mahogany dowling. Check that out. Now when I separate these, I'm going to lose the mark that says pot unless it's on both of them. So I want to do that. Now look at this little pallet knife that I cut down that come in handy for taking off the back. But when I separate these, I'm going to want these to ride on both sides of the bridge here. The floating bridge will be on the other side here. So if I put this one here, like so, and put this one here, like so, that's going to be perfect. But you see what they're trying to do already? They're trying to fall over. So if I want to connect these, I drilled the dowels that are about 50 millimeters in length, like so. And I put them into my two spurs, like so. And I... Simply glue these up the way I want them, and it's one solid piece. All right, we have this thing glued up so it can set up as a unit. Got things blocked off that represent the spacing that we need between the two. Spurs is what we'll call them. The dowels are glued in. Everything is clamped up and lined up, and we'll let this sit overnight before we install it. Okay, you guys watched me make this. It's a nice little template. It's got the radius on it. No, you know that I'm going to paint it chick flick teal, but when I'm going to glue something, know that I'm going to take the glue off of the edges or the paint where it's going to glue. So pay attention to that. But I've decided I am going to go ahead and glue this one up live as it happens. Now, a couple things that we needed. I am going to dowel this we talked about these dowels here i've cut four dowels ultimately this arch that's going to go on here has four dowels and i've got those cut and matched here we're going to put those in last because these things work three-dimensionally so they could twist this way they could twist this way back and forth here uh, there's any number of things that could happen. So if you glue the dowels in first, you may find as the thing sets to itself to the guitar, uh, the things may flex around. It's easier to glue these in and put a little spacer in here to keep things right. But you're going to see me do all that as we go. little trick I wanted to show you now that the camera angle is right. Anytime you want to match a radius on something, you can't get right to it. Sometimes it's hard. Uh, you've seen me do this, um, trying to figure out how much the part where the neck uh, comes into the body is. But you can take um, anything you want to uh, draw the radius to and take a washer, like so. And then you just take a pencil and put it in the washer and roll the washer like so and it will give you the mark of the radius you see that it just sets it off a little bit here and this is basically how I matched this to here like so I couldn't do that when I was cutting it but when this was bigger I took the washer and did it that way and you can see that it fits perfectly now I did the same thing with these spurs or struts or whatever you want to call them so let's get to work on showing you exactly how I will glue this up. so the first thing I'm going to tell you there's not enough hands I have a bag a bean bag at the back end of the guitar I have this part uh, the neck part supported you want to remember when the back is off and if you don't have that strut 
uh, bar on here. This is real fragile and it will twist back and forth and ultimately mess up your neck angle. But the th thing we want to talk about is these fit fairly snug to these so we can glue them in. I have all the pieces here ready to go. Now you remember I put a mark here and here which is where the bridge centers up on on the arch top it sits like that and we know that because we laid out the intonation and it played really well so what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to straddle that mark with these two pieces and I'm going to want to keep them like so so I've cut a little you call it pillar block you can call it whatever you want but notice that I have holes drilled already for the doweling I'm going to use, but I want this to line up where this is the center of where everything sits is going to be right in the center there. That's really important. Now, I've cut this pillar block below these edges. If I have one that's a little bit taller, like this one, what's going to happen is when I go to clamp everything down, it's going to get in the way. So I want this pillar block here that I'm going to use to be a little bit shy of sticking out of the top. I'm actually going to glue the pillar block to the center but out of the way of where these dowlings will go into. So I have ground uh, and sanded everything down so these come in good contact. Um, the, the bottom is first come in with the arch top and I also have this again with the bean bag back here so this part is hanging in air if I have underneath something underneath here and I go to push this down everything is not going to line up the way I want it to again this part is suspended over there so I've got a pencil here and I've got everything lined up where I need it to be glue wants to slip remember that glue always wants to drift once you've got it's sat, so I don't want it drifting back, and we're going to let it tack up a little bit as we go. But, first thing we're going to do is I've made these marks here. So, I'm going to scoot this out of the way, and I am going to put a bead of tight bond. Yeah, I'm using tight bond right over that mark, like so. Everywhere everywhere there will be that like so I'm also going to put a blop of it right there where that center mark is and I have a brush that's damp and I'm just going to make sure everything is right where it needs to be like so paint that on there and I am not going to forget that the tone bars are going to be incorporated in this fix. So I'm going to get some glue on there as well. Like so. I'm not going to race a lot here. It is hot in the shed, but I'm not going to race a lot here because if this tacks up a little bit, things will want to stay in place. So. I'm going to take this again and make sure that I line it up with the center mark there. And I'll push that pillar block down. There we go. And I'm just going to make sure the glue is painted in there and makes good contact with everything. I think the acoustic properties of this guitar this idea that we're going to strum and it's going to play on its own and everything is going to be wonderful. That went out the window and we started putting all these chick flick teal fabric in here. But anyway, let me get this done and I'll catch up with you in a minute. Main thing is we need to make sure that the pathways for these dowels don't conflict with this pillar block as it's glued in. Okay, you guys have seen me use one of these before. It's a glue syringe. I've put tight bond in here because as we get going and things start settling in, I can go along here and inject really small amounts, like almost like caulking, 
into areas that I want to make sure I've got good glue contact, especially where everything comes in contact with the spurs. The spurs, or I mean the tone bars, they need to be an integral part of this, so the glue needs to make contact there. Again, anywhere where there's going to be any possibility of a gap, I want that filled in. And then when we put our, our weight on this and clamp it, you're going to see some stuff come out and we'll, we'll address that as it happens. But last thing I need you to know is we are actually going to make sure that these are attached to the pillar block. There we go. Yeah, keep some water around a damp paint brush because that's a good way to get any runoff and globs that you don't want out of the way. Just water them down. Also, it's a good way to work things into spots that are hard to reach. There we go. Okay, this is the tricky part. We need a bunch of hands. I've got a couple of these uh, cigar box guitar neck cutoffs here. I'm going to put one on each side of the pillar block like that. They're the same height. Now I want you to notice that when I push down here, this top is moving. And it's supposed to because there's a gap there. We're trying to push things back down, or in other words, hold them up. So I've got a couple of these big blocks, like so as well. Those are just big craft blocks. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this longer piece of cutoff and come to the side of the guitar. And I can use a couple of clamps to get things in place, like here. I'll use this clamp to kind of line things up. Um, that's not where I'm ultimately going to clamp. I'm just going to need to line things up because I'm going to use big metal clamps on the sides here. But this is a hassle, trust me. But the thing is, we're going to try to clamp and squeeze this down. Let me get this set up. So you can see me not struggle and save you also. Again, I need too many hands here, but here's the deal. I've made these calls that kind of fit um, these tone bars, but they also will fit over the side of the curving. And I can just slide this. And I've got these two clamps here that are padded. And now they're just a tad, so just a tad taller than than or shorter when this needs to be but as I clamp this down I can see that the glue is oozing out of here meaning that everything is lined up where it needs to be there and it's matching the radius of the top of the guitar or the soundboard Again, had I not fit this before this collapsed, this would be a nightmare to try to figure out. So I'm just going to go along now and play a little bit around, make sure there's glue everywhere, make sure that the bleed off that I uh, need to get out of here is gone, but mainly that everything where there is glue supposed to be lining up is in touch with everything. Okay, a little trick here. If you've got any gaps in between your tone bar and your spar here. You can take some thin shim material that you cut on your scroll saw, your band saw, and score it with your flush cut saw and then just work it with a file and do whatever you need to do and pop some glue in here with your syringe. This syringe is really a handy tool. Keep it on wet cloth. But anyway, you can just pop that in here like so and then take a piece of wood and just guide it in there like that. So the thing is, you want really good contact between your spars and the tone bars. And if that takes a little piece of a shim like this and a minute of your time, that's a good thing.
Alright, welcome to the land where glue has dried. And we're going to get this unclamped here and have a look at the end result. Need a little bit bigger workbench. Again, these calls that sit over the side of the curving and the edge of the guitar worked out great here. There we go. I can tell from the way I use my walk, I'm a woman's man, no time to talk. No. Can you believe I just pulled that off or tried to? I can tell from whether there's air gaps or not underneath the bridge how this worked out, and it worked out fine. Turn it just a little bit and put the straight edge on the guitar and... It's right back to where we started from. I am going to flip this thing over now. And using the marks and some deja vu, we are going to put the back, the back on this thing. Okay, you will remember the last time we put the back on this, we found some friends that really helped us out. First off, the vibratory sander. We just went around, set it on a lower setting, made sure that everything was okay. Then when we came across stuff that was a little bit high, we used this Stumac file that doesn't have any teeth on the side or the front there and just leveled things out. And then when it come time to make sure that everything was unilateral across the way. We used this piece of straight edge, which is just a cigar box guitar neck cut off that reaches across everywhere. And we can just basically sand like this and make sure that everything is level. Then of course we took the back, in which we'd done all these cleats and everything, and did the same thing. Went around it with a vibratory sander, was our main weapon of choice here. You'll also remember me telling you when we put the back on to use hide glue that's heated up and we certainly don't want to use tight bond for this application because we would have never been able to take the back off again had we used tight bond. Now, quick recap because you've seen this before. This guitar and guitars like it are very fragile when they are apart. The neck is extremely loose. You can move it back and forth. So to try to glue this thing on in one shot is a mistake. So we're going to start at the bottom. We're going to use these marks that we use to line everything up. And we are going to glue using this type of clamp. It's a pistol clamp. They're fairly economical. You just do this to tighten them up. They're not metal, so they won't crush everything. But when it gets to a point where we need to pull the sides in, because the sides are bagging out this way and this way, we simply take a bigger one like this, and without a lot of effort, we just put this in here and tighten it up ever so slowly. And you will see that the sides are going to come in. But we're actually going to glue this up in sections and that takes a couple days. So I'll get the first section glued up, show you how that's done. You can refer to the other episode. You're gonna see us using a glue syringe that that's filled up with high glue, as well as a brush that has been dampened. Um, the syringe can work like a caulking gun per se, but we're just gonna basically go in and take our heated up high glue. Do not use high glue that is fresh out of the bottle that's not heated because you're not going to get the full sticking capacity or adhesion of the glue 
and when it's heated up it gives you some good working time like so and we're going to put it on both surfaces again we're going to come up to a known spot where we can control the work the last thing we are going to glue is the part up here because this is where the neck pitches one way or another and I've said this incessantly but this much of a misplacement up here turns into a big problem on the angle of the neck again take something that's wet and get the bleed off while the hide glue is still wet if you are working on a Gibson or some very expensive guitar, you would have this masked off with an, a tape that didn't have very high adhesive, so you're not ruining the finish. So I think you get the drill. We're just going to come along. And after we've sanded all this off and made sure everything was good, we coat both services. And then clamp everything down. The last thing we will do is inject a little hide glue with our syringe at the end. All right, the first third is done. Everything is lined up here. You'll notice it up here, especially in this area, that as I move along, I'm going to have to winch this way and cinch that way. But up here right now, there is a gap. And that gap will be taken up as I lift this neck up. Again, that matters about the neck angle. And then, of course, as I do that, for these marks to line up right now, these marks are about an eighth of an inch off. So as I pull this all around and cinch it together with clamps, again, taking the back off an arch top is goofy, and then trying to glue it all back on at once is just as goofy my specialty. Let's close this out. All right, guys. Thank you for your patience because mine is wearing thin. You've seen me do the same thing to this guitar a couple times. So again, back to the old adage, know what you're getting into. If I would have paid $200 for this guitar, I don't know how many hours I have into it. And luthiers that are $50 an hour are hard to find, much less ones that will put up with this kind of stuff and charge you the money that I have into this guitar. Okay. So it's reward time for the people that watch the end of it. Now, the people that watched the end of the last episode, again, this was going to be one big episode, but I decided to split it up so you could carry on with some semblance of normal life function. No, I don't need messages about what that means to you, but you see this guitar over here. It came out of the Sean Mann Dude Collection, which is infamous for the worst guitars ever. I have another one on the shelf that someone tried to file the neck down and literally the uh, reinforcement rod, not the truss rod, but the reinforcement rod is sticking halfway out of it. I'm going to find something very special to do with that, but again, it is another guitar that's going to take a lot of work. Fortunately, it's the same model guitar that big boy Arthur Crudup used, so watch for that one. But anyway, back to this one. Have you ever seen a guitar like this? Notice that there is the pattern of a bridge that sat there, but there are no bridge holes. Typically something sits on top of a flat top and then the pins drop down so there are holes. There's no evidence of anything ever being glued on there, even though you have a pronounced shadow of where the bridge is. Also, this thing had a tailpiece, a trapeze tailpiece, not per se a trapeze because a one piece didn't move, but it had that thing that clipped onto the back that kind of looked like Art deco -y right up here. In fact, if you look at this guitar right here, there's one like it. And there's also a bridge that just floats. And this is a 12-string guitar. And it says Stella, and this is Lead Belly. Tell the story again. Sorry for those of you that heard it the last 
end of last episode, but Lead Belly, Leddy Headbetter, was in prison. He was a murderer. The Lomaxes came around. I've talked about Alan Lomax. Now we're talking about his father, John, who usually had uh, Alan in tow when he was younger, funded by the Library of Congress. Uh, ethnomusicology, preserve records of times fading away in music that might be fading away. So you find this guy in a prison. He does chain gang songs, prison march songs, uh, work chants, whatever. But for some reason he knew how to play a guitar. He could play a 12-string guitar. So the Lomax has convinced the warden, let this guy go, um, pardon him by playing one song, and I already told you what that was. Anyway, why am I rambling on like this? Well, when Lead Belly could buy his own guitar, that's what they called him, he went out and bought a Stella. We've talked about Stella before. Stella was a brand name, a patented brand name, of Oscar Schmidt, who started selling off their stuff and rights to their stuff when the Depression started. So they sold off the rights to the Stella guitar brand name and focused on keeping auto harps and zithers as their main market. So Harmony brought, bought them up, so you started seeing Harmony produce Stella brand guitars. This guitar has a very pronounced V-neck, which means it's pre-World War II. This, had, this is a 12-string. It's a slotted 12-string headstock or peg holder, very wide uh, fingerboard. This is a Stella from the same vintage as this guitar. It's got a couple little problems, nothing uh, major, but we're going to see whether we want to do this one or trade it off for something I particularly have my eye on right now. And that means a trip to see Rob over in Ventura. So that's the end of this episode. We're going to get this thing glued up and put back together. And of course, we will find somebody that will play it in its quite less than pristine condition. Thanks for watching. Give me a like and a subscribe if you have not. And keep your eye on my Instagram post because they kind of tell you what's going on day to day because these episodes stretch on for weeks and weeks and even months. See you soon.